Hello respected viewers, I'm George from Ireland. Here I am at the Magdala pub in London and this is the place where Ruth Ellis shot dead David uh, Blakely on the 10th of April 1955. So Ruth Ellis became um, infamous as the last woman executed in the United Kingdom. Um, Ruth Ellis was born in Wales in um, 1926 and she was Belgian on her mother's side. I think she's actually English on her father's side, though she was born in Wales. So her maiden name was Nielsen, and she had um, at least one younger sister. Her mother had come to this country as a refugee, as a child in the First World War, and never left. I don't think Ruth Ellis actually grew up speaking French or, or um, uh, Flemish, despite being half Belgian. Anyway, they later moved to um, southern England, grew up a bit to the west of London. I don't remember the particulars. But uh, as an adolescent in the Second World War, she moved to London. Remember it being the norm to leave school age 14 back then. She did, worked in, did various sorts of work. Um, she worked in a review bar, um, a dancing nude, things like that. She had some bit parts in some films. She's had a tiny role in that film Lady Godiva about that uh, countess who famously rode around Coventry nude um, to shame her husband into reducing tax, except they all agreed not to look, but Peeping Tom looked out and got struck blind. Anyway, so uh, she had a somewhat loose lifestyle. Um, she'd worked um, as a prostitute. She'd had um, two abortions, both illegal. She had one child and um, she married a much older dentist, really for his money. Um, but that relationship soon turned sour. Um, so she got her divorce had been finalised not long before she killed David Blakely, but her marriage had been effectively over for some time, involved with a Mr. Cusson, then find, finally David Blakely. Um, so David Blakely was abusive to her. She was pregnant. He punched her hard in the stomach. That, released, uh, that resulted in her miscarrying her child. So she had a rather sad life and um, very bad taste in men. Um, anyway, she finally saw red with David Blakely, who'd earlier proposed to her, but she turned him down when he realized that she was, he was having a relationship with another woman. So she seemed to start a relationship with another man herself. And this wasn't explored at the trial, who, uh, who provided with the firearms, the fire, so far as I know. And any abetment um, of, of a crime, if you expedite it or encourage it in any wise, makes you equally guilty. Her, her accomplice could have been charged uh, as a principal because he'd confederated with her in the furtherance of this murder plot. Anyway, she took a taxi to a house of David Blakely's friends, only a quarter of a mile away, hoping to find him there and to kill him, but he wasn't there. So she came to this ale house he was known to frequent, the Magdala, named after, I think it's somewhere in, in, in Ethiopia, because that 1860s campaign, British and Indian campaign against Abyssinia, as then was. Um, and being very early summer, a, a bright and warm evening, he was standing outside drinking with his friends. And so she um, uh, drew her revolver and closed in for the kill. And um, uh, he saw her and then took fright. He realized she was a bent on murder. So um, she opened fire, I think she missed once, um, and he began to retreat, pleading with her. He, um, she shot him, he fell over on the ground. He fell over on the ground and then she emptied her, um, emptied uh, the revolver into him. Um, and you can see the damage on the wall from the ricochets. They've deliberately left it since 1955. Um, and then one of the bullets missed and it, 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 it hit a woman who was walking by and this um, passerby was just minorly wounded in the hand. Uh, anyway, so she stood over him pulling at her revolver trigger several more times, even after she'd emptied the chamber, and seemed as if dazed, and everyone stood around. I mean, nobody came to his aid or shouted anything, I mean, as in trying to try to stop her killing him. Um, they then tried to administer first aid, but he was well beyond medical help. Death was more or less instantaneous. I don't know if she hit him in the heart or not, but, um, you know, several bullets in the chest will do it for almost anybody. E e even if he didn't die that second, um, he was really just on a one-way, trip to death. Even the best hospital in the world couldn't bring it back at that point. Anyway, so then she said, I think you should call the police, Clive. I don't know who this man she was, she knew who was standing by. And, and she stood there like preternaturally calm, um, as though scarcely conscious, Con conscious just blinking, blinking, saying nothing, making no attempt to escape. And when the police came, she went quietly. She didn't put up any resistance to her arrest. And she instantly admitted what she had done, um, perhaps very unwisely. 
Anyway, so she was um, charged with um, murder, and um, uh, that was it. It was seemed to be sort of the the archetypal open and shut case. Uh, what else about her? Um, anyway, so she was tried before Mr. Justice Havers, Mr. Mishkong, a well-known solicitor, son of a renowned South London rabbi, was, was on her side. I can't remember who her defence barrister was. Um, but um, anyway, uh, she was held at uh, Her Majesty's Prison, Holloway, which is a women's prison not too far away from here. We're, we're, we're north of the Thames, and I think women actually on either north or south of the Thames were always incarcerated there. She was just on remand. But she had hair dye brought in. She was allowed to wear her own clothes whilst on trial. You always are in the United Kingdom. And she dyed her hair sort of peroxide blonde. And the defence thought this would produce a better impression on the jury. Someone so feminine and glamorous couldn't possibly be guilty of murder. Although that may have backfired. Anyway, her defence counsel asked, the, asked her at the trial, what did you intend when you fired the gun at Mr Blakely? And she said, to kill him. With those words, she may well have talked her way onto the gallows. If she'd said, to give him a fright, I was trying to miss, but I accidentally hit him, the jury might have believed that, and that might have saved her life. Um, so uh, the, the barristers are not allowed to coach their witnesses, and not allowed to practice and say, I'm going to ask this question, and this is the answer you have to give. No, 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 not that answer. Give the one I tell you to. Uh, that would be against the ethics of the profession. Perhaps they do it anyway sometimes. Um, but <laughs> maybe it was the wrong, the wrong question to ask. Even if she hadn't said that, she probably would have been convicted because she was seen by about a dozen witnesses um, uh, who were immediately at the scene committing murder. She had instantly and repeatedly acknowledged she'd committed murder. The firearm was found, the murder weapon with the fingerprints on it. I mean, there was really not the slenderest doubt about it. So um, anyway, Mr. Justice Havers, he's father of Nigel Havers, and I think is it, uh, um, who's that woman? Butler Sloss, Baroness Bat Butler Sloss, a well-known jurist. Anyway, uh, Mr. Justice Havers, he duly donned the black cap and he pronounced a sentence of death upon her saying, Ruth Ellis, the sentence of this court is you should be taken here from here unto a lawful prison, whereat you shall be detained until the passage of three, until three Sundays clear and then hanged by the neck until you are dead and buried within the prison walls. May the Lord have mercy on your soul. And the gavel would come down. Um, so uh, that was it. Now, it remained to the Home Secretary to um, uh, grant a stay of execution or a reprieve. She could have had her, her, her um, uh, death penalty um, commuted to life imprisonment because um, Her Majesty the Queen can exercise the royal prerogative of, of mercy, and, but she only does so on the, on the advice of her ministers. And so the Home Secretary at the time was Major Gwilym Lloyd George, son of the famous Prime Minister David Lloyd George, who was actually a national liberal, Gwilym Lloyd George, one of the last you know, in Parliament, an MP for Newcastle Central, though effectively a Conservative. Um, but uh, he said, no, I shan't be advising Her Britannic Majesty to be clement in this case. And a leading factor in convincing him that, that this woman who asked swing was she had opened fire in a crowded street. He said, I will not have that because that other person who was hit by a stray bullet could easily have been killed. Thankfully, suffered only a flesh wound. Um, anyway, so matters were delayed till the 10th of July or was it the 13th of July. A bit surprising that it took three months. So the passage of three Sundays clear, enough time for her, allow her to write her last letters, to make her will a few last visits, but she refused to seek a stay of execution. Had she delayed it and delayed it and appealed and she didn't want to, then um, a campaign for mercy could have built, her life could have been spared. And there was a protest outside the gate of Royal Holloway Prison, not Royal Holloway, sorry, because that's the university, Holloway Prison, saying that, she, you know, she ought to be spared. Um, here she was, a 28-year-old mother. It seemed wrong to um, kill her. So she's always been a, a good time gal. Um, not that I'm slut shaming, I don't think it's bad to be promiscuous, but her last date was with Albert Pierpoint, who was the United Kingdom's fully licensed executioner. Um, so the morning of her execution is due to take place at nine in the morning, if memory serves. There was a phone call to the prison, um, to the prison governor, said to be the secretary of, of uh, Willem Lloyd George. A woman was calling up. They couldn't get whether it was a miss or a missus, but she gave a surname, saying, no, the Home Secretary says, no, 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 don't go ahead with this. And anyway, they couldn't confirm the identity of this person. They assumed it was someone in a desperate last ditch attempt to save Ruth Ellis's life. And that this caused a one minute delay, but perhaps surprisingly, they went ahead with the execution. I wouldn't have. I would have insisted on confirmation. What if this is genuine? What if there really is a reprieve? Now, the latest I ever heard of reprieves coming through were about 12 hours earlier. And I did, did hear of someone, of someone um, phoning the Home Secretary about three o'clock in the morning 
as in roughly six hours before the execution was, the execution was scheduled, a solicitor saying he had new evidence and the Home Secretary saying, no, 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 that's nonsense. I don't think it was Willem Lloyd George in that particular case. I'm not talking about the, the, the Ruth Ellis case where someone was phoning up six hours earlier with supposedly uh, exculpatory evidence. But um, so some woman posing as an official at the Home Office had phoned up the, uh, the prison um, within an hour of the execution saying, no, 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 this is not to go ahead. That's an order from the Home Secretary. Um, so, but uh, they decided this must be someone who's lying to them and they did execute the woman just a tiny bit after it was meant to happen because Albert Pierpont usually went in on the dot to the condemned cell to take her to the gallows and then she'd be given the long drop when death was usually instantaneous, breaking her neck between the second and third vertebrae and as per the table of drops prepared by, for, for the Home Office by, I think it was um, William Calcraft um, around about 1910. And so that was her. So she was buried within the walls of the prison, have a perfunctory funeral. Obviously, her corpse will, will be left to hang for roughly an hour. Um, it had to be witnessed by the prison governor, the prison doctor, um, uh, usually the high sheriff of um, the county. Um, but in this case, that's obviously Greater London. And there'll be two prison warders there. Obviously, it's the hangman and the assistant hangman, wardresses, I should say. Women were guarding her. But the ones who've been with her most of the night would go off uh, duty about an hour beforehand. And obviously very wearing on them. You can think how nerve shredding it was. They got to know her over a few months, just two of them playing board games or whatever, passing the time. And they saw the better side of her, may have developed some affinity for her, have this bond of affection with her, feel sororal. And it would just be too galling for them to be with her to the moment she was actually killed. And some people went, crying, some people lost control of their bowels in the hours beforehand. I don't know what she was like, but um, it was another execution. I can't remember, it was Sid Durnley said, none of them ever said a word. Um, so they leave the body suspended for an hour because there might be some uh, automatic muscular activity. But the person was still dead. This is sort of, um, what would you call it? Some sort of reflex action. And then the doctor would, always, would, would confirm her dead, pronounce her dead and say, yes, this was injury to the central nervous system consequent upon uh, judicial hanging examine the generative organs, confirm that there was no pregnancy. I think that would have been done hand, long time beforehand as well, because she couldn't have been topped had she been gravid um, and buried within the grounds of, of Holloway Prison. Now, after 1966, when, when the death penalty was, was suspended, uh, the Home Secretary, Roy Jenkins, said, OK, the families of the executed can actually get their corpses, because quick lime have been scattered over the bodies, so they've been reduced to, to, to mush, really, except for the teeth almost as, as, as soon as they um, were put into the ground. Um, so they dug up what mortal remains there were of her. It was really just mulched into the soil. And this loam was, was um, then interred at Amersham, Buckinghamshire, in an ordinary graveyard, because previously, otherwise the family actually couldn't visit the grave. So that was her, her son, I don't know, maybe, maybe lives on to this day. So um, a tristful tale of, 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 um, uh, of Ruth Ellis. And the Home Secretary at the time said, if we don't execute this woman when there's, a, when there's an absolute certain murder and she's done so in a way that could have killed other people, then how can we ever execute a woman again, no matter how heinous uh, her offence? So that is the end of Ruth Ellis. So please subscribe to my channel, follow me on Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. I do lessons in history, politics, religious studies, English language, English literature, English as a foreign language, French, law, and I'm a tour guide of London. So contact me. Toodaloo.